compute and resonate, creating electroacoustic music of the acid genre utilizing accessible artificial intelligence computer based generative tools by Dr. Dylan Davis. Introduction Whilst the history of machines automatically generating music goes back to early computing, the use of artificial intelligence to generate musical content is a relatively recent phenomenon. With the advancements in software development and music software, AI compositional tools are now readily available to, mu to musicians outside the field of computer science and musical research. Today, musicians with no computer programming experience can utilize these tools to write compositional musical compositions to further develop variations and progressions to, to melodic compositions and develop rhythmic compositions. Acid music originated in the late 80s with sound cl characteristics closely linked to the Roland TB303 synthesizer. Whilst a commercial failure for Roland ceasing production in 1984, the TB303 sounds defined a new genre of music, acid music. Acid music, much like the house music before it, closely embedded the technology readily available to producers at the time. The sound of the acid is di directly related to the functionality of the TB303. The characteristic slides, accents and transpositions of acid music all derive from the pitch variations of the Roland TB303, the high degree of repetition, and the modulation of frequency and resonance and decay. Implementation. The first stage used three generative tools to, gener to create and develop a series of electroacoustic compositions in the acid genre. The tools utilized for melodic generation were Google Magenta Studio and Skinnerbox Sting. The rhythmic component of these compositions was created utilizing Sonic Charge's Microtonic software and its Patternarium website. Here you can see the Patternarium website Generate and Sting. Discussion. To understand or to evaluate the music created by these, we had to understand the characteristics of the elements of acid house genre. The rhythm element, the baseline element, and the pad element. The rhythm element is usually one bar created with various drum sounds, both either a four to the floor or breakbeat, and various pattern variations for such elements such as the introduction, the breakdown, intros, fills, those kind of things. The bass line is usually one bar long with up to, up to 16 notes, monophonic containing accent, slide, and octave variations. The pads, four to 16 bars with chord progressions, polyphonic, and velocity elements. Sting being purposely designed to create acid patterns was a particularly useful tool. However, one of its shortcomings was the inability to generate MIDI clips. This process was done by making use of Ableton Live's MIDI routing and routing MIDI clips from Sting into separate MIDI tracks where each pattern could be recorded for appraisal and performance. The patterns created by Sting were one bar long with potential for 1 to 16 steps contain velocity variation for accented notes and overlapping notes for slide sounds. Generate is specifically designed to create MIDI clips. There were issues with the suitability of the melodic content produced by Generate in regards to the musical characteristics of the acid house genre. One shortcoming of Generate was that it was created four bars of MIDI data in each clip, whereas ACID commonly consists of one bar patterns with variations created through the modulation of parameters such as frequency, resonance and decay. As Bertling uh, describes, turning its resonance filter to max, the machine would generate the extreme synth whale which came to define the acid style of ACID house. A further shortcoming of Generate was the lack of velocity variation to produce the characteristic acid accented notes, a key characteristic of the acid of acid music. A further limitation of generate was that it could only produce monophonic melodies, which meant it could not create overlapping MIDI notes to produce the characteristic slide sound of acid house. This lack of velocity variation was also an issue for sequencing FM synthesis sounds of the rock called Volker FM. The specific sound patches would produce changes in timbre, timbre and dynamics based on the velocity value of the note. This was also true with sequencing the Roland JX03, where dynamics of the notes played Respond, the, the dynamics of the notes played responded to the velocity of the incoming notes and the synthesizer's filter of respond to incoming notes velocity. Once the melodic patterns had been created, each MIDI clip was then recorded into Electron Digitac. The Digitac has eight MIDI channels. Each of these, this meant each pattern on the Digitac could contain two patterns each for the RE303, the Volker FM and the JX03. There'd be two available MIDI tracks for further patterns. 
This allowed for melodic patterns to be switched using the channel mutes on the Digitac without the need to change patterns on the Digitac. This setup was ideal for, for using transition clips generated by Continue as the transitions between clips created either by Sting or Generate. The rhythmic part of the performance was straightforward to create using Sonic Charger's Microtonic software. Microtonic's drum synthesizer was able to recreate the characteristic sounds of acid genres such as the Roland T R707, TR808 and TR909 drum machines. It was also able to create other percussive elements such as melodic tom drums or as, as well as more atonal metallic type sounds. The rhythm patterns were previewed on the Patternarium website and suitable patterns were downloaded and then each pattern was loaded into the VST. These patterns were created for, for specific genres and once and the ones chosen were suitable for acid genre. Each pattern had several variations such as, such as breakdowns, fills, in addition to the main rhythm. With the Digitac loaded with audio and MIDI data, the other synthesizers connected via MIDI split, it was then possible to rehearse the performance and evaluate how, how each element worked together. Several potential performances, performance pathways were mapped to allow for variations within a performance rather than a linear flow. From a personal perspective, as a performer, I find it necessary to have these multiple pathways that allow for exploration during performance rather than one route where a performance can feel more like pressing a start button. There were several reasons for the use of hardware synthesizers and sequences rather than utilizing a laptop and software emulation. The use of hardware sequences and synthesizers are specifically designed for performance with functionalities mapped to specific user elements. By using hardware, there is a distance between the performance tools and the computer-based AI and generative tools due to create melodic and rhythmic elements of performance. This separation of performance and creation allows for a deeper reflection on the specific requirements of each as aspect and deeper conversations with, with each of these parts. The use of hardware adds an extra step in the production process creating it between creation and performance. This extra step for, from a curatorial perspective could improve the choice of melodic and rhythmic elements used in performance. With an entire, entirely computer-based setup, it would, it, it would be entirely possible to have hundreds of banks of patterns to swap between and choose, rather than limitations of the hardware akin to early ACID music production. Conclusion These accessible AI tools worked well in the rapid creation of large amounts of both melodic and rhythmic elements. They were incredibly simple to use and required no programming knowledge. The use of Sing is particularly suited to creating ACID patterns, and one short pattern from many for other genres that require velocity variation and slide information. Generate was a useful tool for creating interesting melodic sequences, though it did have several, several shortcomings, as I listed earlier, and these were shared with other tools within the Magenta Studio. Sonic Charger's Microtonic software was extremely well suited for the creating of drum sounds and drum sequences, and the addition of the Patternarium creation tool for the creation of rhythmic patterns makes the software even more powerful. The shortcomings of these tools could be in part remedied by using MIDI plugins within the live environment and some manual editing. It is noteworthy that both Sting and Magenta Studio are free tools. Practical implications of findings suggest that musicians can utilize AI as part of a compositional process without the need for in-depth programming knowledge. Of the tools presented in this paper, Magenta and Sting work only in the Max for Live environment within Ableton Live digital audio workstation software. Another potential issue with these tools is that any of these, any of the, any user of these tools is at the whim of their creators? Google may decide to discontinue Magenta at some point in the future. Microtronic would would, only, would work within any digital audio workstation software as it is able, that is able to host a VST plugin. Of the tools used, the major missing component would be an accessible AI-based polyphonic MIDI creation tool that worked within keys and scales and generated progressions. There are several chord tools that exist, but to my knowledge, none of these at this stage utilize AI or machine learning. This would be an interesting area of further research. Thank you for your time.
Okay, hello. My name is Tom Pirard. I'd like to start by thanking Charles and everyone there at ACMC uh, for having me speak and give this presentation. This presentation is an excerpt from a paper I'm currently working on, which is in itself part of a chapter of my PhD thesis. And my thesis is exploring teaching practices uh, where a DAW, I'll refer to them, a digital audio, digital audio workstation, I'll refer to them as, as doors from now on. Um, um, it's looking at how doors can be utilized best in an educational setting, basically. So today I'd like to discuss how instrumental practice can incorporate facets of door music making in ways that allow an instrumentalist modes of practice that would normally fall outside the realm of individual practice. And I want to explore the notion that these methods could be used to develop instrumental proficiency in a unique way. While these methods aren't literally unique to a door, you know, for example, sampling, or you can obviously do it on an MPC or anything like that, or a phone or anything like that. Uh, I would argue that they become so, that is unique, when used via a door, and that the door's multimodal affordance means that we're we're talking about a uniqueness of workflow. I'm a drum set player, and uh, as well as a music technology lecturer, and I've used the drum set as a way of contextualizing this study. So this study came as a response to other research, which points to a growing number of door users among school age learners, as well as the need for intelligently designed curriculum which shows consideration given to not just how doors should be taught in classrooms, but also why. It's become something of a passion of mine to explore affordances of doors which can be interpreted in ways that aren't immediately apparent. I think this is a necessary step in understanding how doors can not only be integrated into curriculum alongside conventional musical concepts such as notation, conducting, etc., but also how they can support them. So these are the main points that I've been coming across in my research, such, such as the ubiquity of, of doors in general in schools, um, questions around affordability and equity of access in music education, um, a need for really zeroing in on why doors are important and have a curriculum that, that, really, uh, that really reflects that. And of course the bottom one, uh, the need for exploration into the doors affordances. And by that I, I mean everyone knows why doors, why and how doors are made and how they are used, but of course they're designed in such a way so that it's really conducive to experimentation. And so there are always new ways to, to use them. Some of the key papers, <clears throat> I won't go into too much detail because I haven't got much time, but uh, these are some really good, uh, yeah, I, I suppose, key, pa key papers that have helped prompt this research and that I, I, I guess summarized in the previous slide. So moving on. What is a door? Of course, everyone here knows what a door is. And... It's a tricky area, especially seeing as the function of doors seems to be constantly changing and extending. You know, for example, the the incorporation of GUI-based software such as Max for Live um, into Ableton, and each new update brings some sort of new tool, such as the update to Logic, which enables non-linear composing, much like Ableton's uh, session view there. For the purposes of this study, I'm going to be referring to uh, I'm going to be using Ableton. Mostly, that's, I guess, my door of choice, but I'm going to be really, when I say a door, I'm meaning uh, the software that we that we know that can perform these functions, this multimodal affordance, that is, there are different modes of creating, be sequencing, recording, uh, that kind of thing, recording, being able to record and edit audio and MIDI, providing a macro and micro control of tone and song structure. And by that, I mean being able to provide a holistic view of the song structure, um, as in the overview, all the way down into the, the micro, I suppose, being able to manipulate tones at the fundamental level. And it also allows the use of audio and MIDI effects. This means finding a new way that a door can be used, you know, going going to the, the topic of the study um, in drum set practice. Uh, for this, I wanted to take four aspects of drum set practice, not, not the main aspects, but they are aspects, the pretty key ones. Timekeeping micro subdivision, supporting song form and strengthening polyrhythmic awareness. And I wanted to really try to use door specific uh, techniques and integrate them into each of these categories of practice. 
So this first method looking at timekeeping, uh, for this one we can see that when you record yourself within a door, you can have a good visual indication immediately of where your playing is in terms of the time, how you're hearing it. Of course you need to have some knowledge of latency and that kind of thing, but, but this is one mode of door use which can help immediately provide some insight into where you need to work on your areas of learning, your areas uh, that you need to develop with your timekeeping. Micro subdivision is a term sometimes used uh, to describe, I suppose, playing rhythmic lilt or you, sometimes people talking about playing before and after the beat. That's really what I mean by this kind of thing. I, I mean talking and uh, subdividing a note into, rhythmically into pieces that are smaller than a 30 second note. Just in obviously in Ableton and other doors you, you have the ability to nudge sequenced notes so you can hear and understand and see importantly what it looks like to have rhythmic lilt and micro subdivision in there. Now you might decide to use this technique and play alongside it, replicate it with your live drumming or to be able to have this as a reference using a quantized, a perfectly quantized uh, sequenced clip and then it, and then play with, uh, make your own micro subdivisions with your, with your acoustic playing using this, like I say, for reference. The third technique here is using a door to increase, I suppose, develop your understanding of how you support the movement of a song, the linear movement of a song. Uh, whether that's performing a fill going into a, a big chorus section or it's toning it down for a verse, that kind of thing. Now, when a drummer uh, who doesn't ordinarily have much experience composing a song, this is where some of these modes of music making, such as what you can see here, the session view or the more linear arrangement view on Ableton can be useful. So what I'm saying here is that by developing compositional practices and being able to play alongside them, which can be done very quickly, uh, very easily, in a, a door, a drummer is able to simultaneously work on how they approach their own drum part within the song, how they approach the development, how they approach the support of the other players. Moving along. Internalizing polyrhythms. It's getting into I suppose not so heavily fundamental, uh, but with regards to polyrhythms, there there are lots of reasons that are good to that are good to work on. Mostly because it increases your awareness of meter. So polyrhythms are easy to sequence. It's a matter of basically du duplicating an odd, um, odd or even number of beats or notes within the uh, the global meter. So this visual indication, you can see that the we have a pattern of five notes over the the bottom line which is indicating the the global meter and you can see how the it's actually creating a five over four pattern which is cyclic and so a drummer can very quickly get in there and sequence these exercises to whatever they whatever they like so they can work on polyrhythms very quickly and easily always having that uh, perfectly quantized reference of the global meter to work with One thing I'd like to point out is that I think this, these techniques all used together um, is what I would consider a real multimodal approach with regards to practice. And multi, a multimodal approach, I personally feel, can create a, a more enriching uh, and effective practice experience. I think these, uh, these methods are all related, they can work together and uh, my theory is that they can support the faster development on your instrument when used in conjunction with each other. So there's a small demonstration here of a polyrhythmic exercise, which is the last one I talked about. Just quickly for this exercise, there's I've used uh, Ableton Session View. I've sequenced uh, some blocked chords. It's using an arpeggiator with the rhythm set to 12-8, basically. Um, so it's divided the bar into twelfths. And... I like this technique because when you basically create a new MIDI clip and you change the number of notes within that MIDI clip, automatically using the arpeggiator you're creating a polyrhythm. So you might have a chord that has 
four notes and then a chord that has seven and of course um, the global meter stays the same but the arpeggiator sets it up so it's, it's playing seven within that four or five within that four you'll see what I mean uh, and accompanying on drums so what's happening here is I'm basically going through a short loop and using a few different approaches to how I'm playing it all designed to try to strengthen my understanding of polyrhythm <laughs> So, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, here we can have the here we have the implications and applications. And really, I haven't really got time to go into this, but uh, you can see there are some some areas there where I think this kind of study deserves uh, some more focus. So, I can it, because I think it may have some impact in these areas. Um, I just like to thank everyone again for listening. Thank you so much. Don't know if there's question time, but here's the screen. <laughs> thank you. My name's Robert Jarvis. I'm a PhD candidate in the School of Design at RMIT University in Melbourne. And uh, this is a video of me testing the sensing system that I used in the work that I'm going to be talking about today, Aileron 1. Aileron 1 is what I've been referring to as a spatial metacomposition. That is a piece of music that is arranged predominantly in three dimensions and is experienced by um, exploring that musical space. In Aileron 1, the method of exploration is sailplane flight. My background is in music performance and software development. It very often involves live audiovisual performance and it is often colourful and it is often experimental. The aim with the system built to create Aileron 1 is to colour space with music so that you create music as you move through a musical space.
And, and the idea here is that patterns in motion, patterns in input data will result in patterns in music. And so we get musical representations of position over time or movement. So you can see we're not really talking about what we usually consider to be spatial music, i.e. there aren't any speaker arrays here. More accurately, we're trying to create a nonlinear musical composition that is a function of a point in space, or spatial metacomposition for short. So the system for a spatial metacomposition might look something like this where we're sensing position, this could be latitude, longitude, altitude, but also things like orientation, angular acceleration. Um, we are applying some sort of process to create a musical result. The sensing unit for Aileron 1 is relatively small, about the size of a deck of cards plus a battery pack, consisted of a Raspberry Pi computer and a Navio 2 flight controller board. It's able to be strapped to your body or attached to a hat. Um, in my case, to initially test the system, I put it in the back of my paragliding harness and captured some paragliding data. The sensing unit communicates directly to another computer which is tasked with interpreting the incoming data and then producing music. Um, log files can be taken off of the sensing unit as well and they can be replayed with the max patch which is also um, responsible for synchronizing associated video files. This allows for a very comfortable offline composition workflow that's similar to something like film scoring where you can scrub through previously recorded um, data and footage. From a composition perspective, I started by looking at two-dimensional distributions of key centers with an idea that you would be able to explore the harmonic progressions that exist distributed out on, for example, a piece of land. And I did this by using a hue to pitch mapping technique. The way this works is you take a cycle of fifths, map the notes of the cycle of fifths to their associated hues. The result of this is that um, distinctly different keys, for example, C and F sharp, are represented as 180 degrees out of phase or complementary colors. The visual effect of, it, of this is that smooth grad graduations in color mean consonance and contrasting colors suggest dissonance. I then extended this idea to be more generalized so that you were associating a particular musical um, element, in this case a phrase of music, a few bars, a note, an arpeggio, something like that, with, an, with a particular hue. And then by using hue interpolation, you can smoothly distribute a range of colors in a two-dimensional or three-dimensional space, which means that as you move through that space, you're only ever going to be passing through neighboring hues, which means as a composer, you can create a group of musical ideas and in order to get from one musical idea to the other, you have to pass through all of the neighboring musical ideas. This means that it, you have some sort of constraint as a composer, but there's also an amount of predictability because you know in order to get from one phrase to another, um, the listener or the performer is going to need to pass through all of the intermediate phrases. And so this is a, a video of the prototype framework in action.
And this is what I've now been starting to refer to as composing in space time with rainbows. Um, because, you know, it's a fun sentence, but also it quite accu accurately um, summarizes this process here we, where we are composing in both space and time and we're using hue as a fundamental property to um, arrange musical ideas. So in that sense, the prototype was a success. In another sense, it didn't sound particularly good. Uh, we sort of showed that it worked, but we didn't have any particularly um, musically satisfying results but it was at least enough to show that the idea worked. And from here, I was confident enough in the um, process to, to create some more mature tools that would actually allow um, compositional flexibility and allow a composer to create an actual piece of music. The next iteration of Tools was built as a set of Max for Live plugins and applied the concept of a hyperstave to Ableton's clip slot system. So clips are grouped together into hyperstaves and they are arranged by hue and hyperstaves are separated by empty clip slots. By switching back and forth between developing the Max for Live devices and composing small pieces of music, I was able to ratchet up in this sort of iterative software development composition process. And once the tools were mature enough to use effectively, I started working on a longer piece of music. So Aileron 1 is the output of that composition and development process. The piece Aileron 1 itself as a composition is structured vertically with layers of instrumentation increasing in density up to 950 meters above the ground. And this instrumentation runs along a repeating chord progression which also extends vertically into the sky. So since the composition as it exists in space is quite simple, it's interesting to see what musical results might emerge when you interact with that kind of space. The first thing that we come across in the case of glider flight is that um, a glider will tend to be towed into the air, it will be released, and then it will glide back down to the ground. And so, in the case of our composition, that means we run through the chord progression in one particular direction until we reach the top of the flight. We glide back down to the ground through the chord progression in the other direction. And so this highlights one of these the sort of key properties of these sort of musical spaces is that they are palindromic. If you write a chord progression, it needs to work in both directions. But this also leads to an interesting emergent point in the composition, which is at the point at which the glider releases from toe. Because as the glider is pulled up through the chord progression, there's quite a high rate of ascent. Because of that, there is quite a rapid progression of chords and a building of tension. And then at the point the glider releases from toe, it goes from rising quickly through the chord progression to flying essentially level. So you get this moment of harmonic suspension at the point at which the glider begins to glide. One of the approaches that I developed in the process of developing the software and writing little pieces of music was to lack a defined meter because that allows you to overlay different rhythmic elements that can act independently. So for example, in this case, the pizzicato violin is 
controlled by the overall velocity of the glider and that can operate independently of the rest of the piece. And also by lacking um, a defined meter, the harmonic content can move freely as well. Not everything worked. In the case of aerobatics, when the glider is moving vertically a lot faster than it would normally in regular flight, the chord progression moves too quickly. So the chords don't really establish themselves. They act almost more like a melody. It's musically interesting, but is perhaps not necessarily desired and for composers to have more control in the same way you might have levels of detail in a 3D model. We need to consider compositions at various scales so that they can take into account being performed at a variety of velocities. So just to explore um, some of the potential applications of these sort of systems, I want to compare it to existing work First, I think um, an interesting point of comparison is with Dolores Catherino, who ha has a microtonal um, music practice she describes as polychromatic music. And she actually conceives of Hugh as an additional spatial dimension in her, um, in her compositions. And so when I started colorizing pitch, it transferred to notation so easily um, that uh, it, it just allowed a great expansion in the number of pitches we could handle per octave. Hugh is really good at representing things that are circular, and in music there are a lot of circular things. We're often working with loops. As frequency rises, there is a repeating cycle of octaves. Musical structure is defined in part by repetition. There are opportunities for applications of hue in the development of, for example, interfaces or creative approaches to composition, improvisation, that sort of thing. Another important point of reference is the work of Rolf Gohar, who in 1985 created a work called Sound Equals Space which is perhaps the first example of what I'm describing as um, spatial metacomposition. There's a, a paper, Rolf Gelhar, Pioneer in Creative Music Technology, which outlines Gelhar's motivation in the creation of his works, notably his humanitarian commitment to the development of technological resources designed to widen participation in musical creation and performance. And I think there's sort of an opportunity with these sort of systems to turn anything into music, um, any kind of movement. And so, so there's a wide set of applications for um, various kinds of interaction that will meet people where they're at. To keep up with this work, check out zeal.co and Zeal TV on YouTube. Hi, my name is Scott Stickland. I'm a third year PhD candidate at the University of Newcastle. Today, I'll be presenting a paper I've co-authored with Nathan Scott and Ruxin Atara. They are my supervisors. The paper, Towards a Vision for a Virtual Door Collaboration Studio for Professional Post-Production Music Projects. In the current climate of social isolation, restrictions, working from home and toilet paper shortages, it is perhaps an opportune time to focus our attention on online collaboration platforms. It stands to reason that any online collaboration environment must be effective and inclusive. You've got to get the work done as professionally as possible and have the ability to link in with any number of co-workers, classmates, lecturers, teachers, for example. However, as Peter Burris in his eWeek article 
COVID-19 era will tell us much about future of collaboration tools observed. Buying a bunch of work from home infrastructure on the presumption that somehow dynamic, complex and high value work will naturally manifest on that infrastructure is, well, nuts. He talks about the social context of an activity as the essential ingredient for an effective online collaboration environment. Burris goes on to say that once the social context is understood, developers have to create digital spaces to perform the work of that context. Building great collaboration tools is not about trying to stuff more video into a cloud-based connection. It's about creating digital spaces that are conducive to operating in that social context. The social context of our paper specifically focuses on professional music or audio post-production. A post-production project begins with a bunch of raw audio files or stems from a recording session and then imported into a door. The stems are tidied up, instruments divided into mix groups and directed to auxiliary buses, for example. Post-production at its heart starts with a uniform mixer console and finishes with a balanced, processed and rendered high fidelity mix of the audio stems. This presentation explores the question what would and what could an ideal online collaboration platform provide for professional music post-production? In an effort to formulate an informed answer, we conducted a series of interviews with professional Australian sound and recording engineers and producers. The interview questions were designed to elicit responses that would assist us in formulating an ideal online collaboration environment. The questions were aimed to establish the participants' door platform of choice and level of expertise in utilising its features specifically and music production techniques in general to establish the typical door functions employed in post-production. The questions determine the participants' use of existing door integrated collaboration solutions and provides a critique of the solution's effectiveness in professional environments. This is to particularly get an impression of the utility and effectiveness of existing door integrated collaboration. Our questions also explore if remote collaboration is practiced outside of the specific door-based solutions, and if so, the methods that are currently being used and how effective they are to establish an accurate picture of today's online collaborative practices. Furthermore, our questions were designed to ascertain an industry standard understanding and expectation of real-time online music collaboration to generate a wish list of professional practitioners ideal collaboration conditions. Furthermore, we determined the level of need for synchronous multi-party collaboration in industry standard studios, focusing on a typical or expected number of participants in the one collaboration session. And finally, our questions also want to explore if keyboard shortcuts and use of controllers are integral to industry standard practices this is so we can get an impression of the typical workflow and door modes of operation. In analysing the responses, it was noteworthy that of the participants who routinely collaborate with others on post-production activities and furthermore use Pro Tools or Cubase as their door of choice, none use the included online collaboration features the door provides. Instead, overwhelmingly, they collaborate with clients or producers asynchronously and by utilising third-party cloud storage. Their reasoning for this varied from never having tried the door integrated collaboration tools to not seeing a difference between these collaboration tools and the way they collaborate now. Starting with a produced recordings audio files or a stereo mix down together with, at times, the door project file, 
The files are uploaded to a cloud storage platform such as Dropbox, Google Drive, or OneDrive for the client slash producer to download, import into their door or music player and audition the work. However, if changes are required, they are communicated back to the mixer who then repeats the process until such time as the client is satisfied or runs out of money, whichever occurs first. Several of the participants who work with video instead export and upload to cloud the post-production project as an advanced authoring format, AAF, or an open media framework, OMF, file, primarily to ensure video audio synchronization, but also to include basic automation, such as level and panning changes. I briefly mentioned earlier that some commercial door platforms already include online collaboration facilities. Pro Tools offers cloud collaboration. Cubase provides VST Connect and VST Performer for synchronous remote recording. And VST Transit, Transit Join for doors other than Cubase and Transit Go for iOS devices. Cloud Collaboration and VST Transit in particular are the existing collaboration tools that provide the same functionality as the third-party cloud storage and file sharing method favoured by the participants we interviewed. Recently, developmental work in the Web Audio API has given rise to browser-based door applications with cloud file storage and intrinsic collaboration capabilities. Platforms such as BandLab, Soundtrap and Amp Studio are seen as an easy way to collaboratively compose and record with remote musicians. Currently, such doors cannot compete with the track count, audio processing and low latency demands of post-production work though it will be interesting to see how far such platforms will develop over the coming years. So what is available for synchronous online collaboration for high fidelity audio post-production? Well, according to the nine professionals we interviewed, nothing. Collaboration of this nature is a novelty to all of them. Despite their various backgrounds, in recorded studio music, recorded live music, music for television and film, and music for gaming. However, they were very forthcoming in producing a wish list of features crucial to the effectiveness of a potential collaboration platform. A summary of their ideal collaboration environment includes being able to see and speak with the client or clients throughout the collaboration session, being able to edit, mix and produce via the operation of an in-studio door application, being able to audition remote changes on the spot and being able to maintain and safeguard the integrity and high fidelity of the production stems or audio files. We believe our research work has the potential to make this vision a reality. Taking guidance from the professional's wish list, we are developing a framework that provides an indoor, in-studio post-production collaboration environment. All changes made in one door are mirrored in all other door instances across the collaboration. It delivers synchronous operation and editing. All changes occur across the collaboration in real time. Track selection, playback and navigation is synchronous. It allows collaborators to audition remote changes on the spot. Whenever mix operations such as level and panning changes are executed, everyone in the collaboration can monitor the changes as they happen. The same is true for insert plugin parameters. All changes made are executed across the collaboration. It provides an environment 
for working with and monitoring high fidelity audio assets. Since all post-production functions are executed indoor, everyone in the collaboration monitors the local playback of their door project's audio. And finally, it offers real-time audio-visual communication via the framework's web application that provides WebRTC video conferencing and interfacing with the DAW's controller MIDI ports. If you are interested in our previous work in this area, our paper outlining the proposed collaboration framework presented at ACMC 2018 is available in the conference proceedings. Likewise, the paper on our proof of concept prototype presented at the Web Audio Conference in 2019 is available in their conference proceedings. We have been working on a fully functional collaboration framework and our technical paper is about to be submitted for publication. So, on behalf of Nathan Scott and Ruksha Natara, I'd like to thank you for paying attention to my video and I guess now I can open the floor for answering any of your questions. Thank you. Hello and welcome to my presentation. This talk is all about making algorithmic music, as seen through the lens of a very particular question. How do I get my computer to understand the music that I want to make? I've spent the last seven years writing and making melodic dance music within the programming language Pure Data. With it, I'm able to tell the computer my musical ideas, get the system to generate patterns, and then I can perform the track in real time. With it, I'm able to make entire pieces of music within 20 minutes, and I've already made hundreds of tracks within it. Today, I want to talk about the pattern generator and how I get it all to work. To help explain this system, I'm going to start by comparing music making to cooking. If you think about making a stir fry, you rarely think in terms of computer instructions. You probably think in much more vague terms. For example, I will make a stir fry. I will boil the rice for 20 minutes. I will simmer the vegetables, proteins, and sauce for 10 minutes. And serve. And if we wanted to create more variety, we can choose from a random selection of ingredients. So how do we get all of this to make sense to a computer? First, we need to break everything up. So let's use the concept as the stir fry to define the structure. Let's use the ingredients as a way to define the inputs. The structure and the inputs are the only two things we need to know to work out how to process and output the sound. The benefits of working within this mental framework is that it gives us all the instructions we need. With it, we can figure out what to do, what order to do it all in, where to put everything, and how long to do everything. So let's take this idea and apply it to music. To make a musical pattern, we need to generate two things, timing and pitch. So let's solve the problem of making rhythms first. The first thing we need is a structure to put everything into. For this, I used the concept of the clave, also referred to as the rhythmic key. The purpose of the clave is to divide a bar of musical patterns into segments. The first beat of each segment is used as a landmark for where we might place a rhythmic event. We can choose whether to place a beat or not using a generative operation. And if we do, we send it to an instrument to play. The clave is our structure and gives us a lot of important information. It tells us the order of operations, where everything goes, and how long it goes for. There are a few different types of clave patterns, but it helps to think of them in terms of how simple or complex they are. Dividing the bar evenly will give us a regular pulse. Using only the even divisions of the bar will give us a steady beat, but not quite a pulse. Using a balance of even and odd divisions will create syncopation. And using an unbalanced mix of even and odd will sound complicated and overwhelming. By describing the balance between simple and complex, we can tune how we want the rhythm to sound. So now that we have our structure, we can start defining inputs. First, we have our instruments, the kick, snare, and hi-hat. As an experienced musician, we can make assumptions about what might sound good to us and start building a generative profile based on that. We probably want a kick drum on the first beat. 
we might want another kick drum near the end of the beat, so we can choose one at random and then lock it in. The snare might sound good anywhere near the middle, so we can choose one of them at random and lock in its position. And we might want to put hi-hats on every single segment. To expand on this, we can add more attributes and musical embellishments and assign them to each of the segments. We might want to add rolls, triplets, or double strokes, or we might increase the note density. And once we finish the pattern, we just send it to the instruments to start making the sounds. So let's recap. We're using the clave as our structure that tells us where we need to put everything, and then we're populating it with inputs that we can describe in simple music theory terms. And then we're processing it and sending it to the output. So that's the rhythm problem solved, and we can already create drum patterns with this. But if we wanted to make a melody, we're going to have to expand this control to include pitch as well. So let's do that. The melody is made up of three elements that need to work together. These parts are the melodic contour, which sets the melodic direction, a scale quantizer to put everything into the same key, and a chord progression to shape the melodic path over time. Let's look at all of these individually. The first step is the harmonic contour. This is a continuous line representing how high or low a pitch might be played. And when a rhythmic event is triggered, a note gets sent out to the instrument. We need a way to control the melodic contour so that we can direct it to our musical intention. So there are three things that we need to define. The shape of the line, the elements of repetition, and the pitch register. There are approximately three different types of lines that we can create. They can be steady, smooth, or jumpy. So we can use these words to describe what type of line we want to create and generate it to our preference. Next, we can introduce elements of repetition. To do this, we divide the contour at each of the clave landmarks. That way, we can call upon these individual sections later. Then we can create repetition by using the clave landmarks to re-trigger parts of the melodic line. This allows us to control how repetitive we'd like it to be. Then to provide more variety, we can make changes to the pitch register in time with the clave landmarks. This means we can create variations in pitch even when the contour line has a lot of repetition. With all of these parameters combined, we have substantial control over the direction, repetition, and register of the melody. The next step is to put the melodic line through a scale quantizer. A scale quantizer takes our melodic contour and aligns all of the notes with a scale that we've pre-selected. This gets everything playing in the same key. It's also important that we can change scales during a piece of music. So there are three things that we need to figure out. What sort of scales do we want? What kind of scale modulation do we want? And when do we want to modulate the scales? To choose our scales, we need a way to sort them. So I put them into five categories. Major and minor, harmonic major and harmonic minor, and symmetrical scales. For each scale, we choose a mode and a key center, and this defines what our root note will be. Then we can count up from the root note to determine what our scale degrees are, which is important information that we will need later. And once we have our scales and its corresponding degrees, we can choose how we want to modulate the scale. There are a few different methods that we can take to do this. We can move around the circle of fifths, we can do simple key changes, we can use modal interchange, moving between minor and major, or we might stick to only minor modes. Once we've selected our desired modulation style, we can move through that list at will, meaning that we can modulate our key in a very intentional way. Then to decide when we want to change between scales, we have three options. We can change mid-pattern, we can change each bar, or we can change after each section. The last part is the chord progression generator. To generate a chord progression, I use the theory of harmonic function as a way to describe what sort of chords I'd like to generate. Harmonic function is based on the theory that we can categorize chord types based on their qualities of tension and resolution. Chords can sound stable, floating, or colorful, and they can also imply a strong sense of direction towards the root note. Using the scale degrees that we determined earlier, we can make an educated guess about what the function of each scale degree is and assign a function based on each of those chords. This allows us to build a chord progression by describing it in vague terms of harmonic function rather than selecting each chord individually. For example, we might choose suspended or color chords, or we might decide to pick any chord that avoids resolution. 
Once we've generated our chord progression, we can move through it by advancing either mid-pattern or at the end of each bar. Knowing what chord we are in allows us to direct how we want the melody to sound by further restricting the available notes within the scale. For example, if we want to play the intervals of the triad, we can count up the intervals starting from the currently selected chord. When we change chords, we simply move the intervals to correspond with the new chord. And we can always modify what intervals we want to play. For example, we can choose to play a pentatonic scale alongside the selected chord instead of the triad. With all of these tools combined, it becomes easy to assign parameters to suit different instruments. For example, a bass line might feature a steady contour, so we might stick to simple intervals, like the root note or the fifth. To play chords, we might use a different contour pattern and stick to the intervals of the triad or extended chords. And the lead instrument might have a smooth contour and play in either a pentatonic or diatonic intervals. And since everything is working to the same rhythmic base of the clave and are quantized to the same key with a scale quantizer and are playing the same chords, everything will stay unified. So let's quickly recap. We're using the clave as our structure so that we know where to put everything. Then we're populating it with inputs that we can describe in simple music theory terms. And then we're sending it to the instruments to make sound. Thus concludes my explanation of how I create musical patterns. I hope this breakdown of my working process has given you a vivid mental framework on how to solve these kinds of problems. I'll include some links to more information in the description. Thank you for listening.